Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, before I get to the content for today, I'm going to talk about something a little bit difficult, um, uh, which um, those of you in Canada have uh, probably um, heard about in the news. It's related to this, um, these um, murders of children at residential schools. Um, if anyone can't deal with that topic, then you might want to tune out for the next five minutes and tune back in when I get to the math. Um, some, it's been affecting me a lot. and I don't like to pretend that it isn't. Um, I know lots of people like to keep politics out of the classroom, but I think who's in the classroom itself is already political. Um, and especially in the context of a story like this, which is about um, the treatment of uh, underrepresented minority uh, within the Canadian education system. Uh, I didn't feel right not speaking about it. Um, it's a topic I've been aware about, aware of for a long time, um, but not, uh, not to the degree I ought to have, um, and uh, not in as personal a way as it really should have been for me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history. Um, so uh, Canadian residential schools were a, a system set up by the Canadian government um, to um, westernize um, the First Nations population within Canada. They ran for close to 120 years. Um, uh, it was not optional to attend. Uh, so Indigenous children from four to 16 years old, sometimes younger than four, were forcibly removed from their parents and educated, um, quote unquote, uh, by the church, mostly the Anglican and Catholic churches uh, ran these with the support and collaboration of the Canadian government. Um, we've known they were terrible for a long time. Um, the earliest record I could find uh, is in a BC uh, magazine from the 40s called Native Voice, a man named George Clutesi, who's a, a Tseshat artist from Albert, Port Alberni, about 100 kilometers from where I grew up, um, who wrote uh, in 1949, uh, uh, or in an interview said, few Canadians, few Indians who've been behind the walls of a boarding school can stand up to a white man and carry on a no normal conversation. All he can say is yes, sir, and no, sir, and you have to bend your ear to hear him. You should accept Indian children as your equals in schools across Canada. It's crazy that there was a system set up until the 90s in Canada, um, which uh, was an enforced segregation of a subset of our population. Um, it's also crazy that um, George Clutesi only got the vote in the same year he spoke those words um, at the age of 44. Um, as I said, the, church, the schools were operated by churches, principally the Roman Catholic and Anglican churches. Um, and last Thursday, um, the Kamloops uh, First Nation in Kamloops, BC, uh, in BC's interior, um, where Thompson River University is, um, issued a press release um, confirming the uh, uncovering of the remains of 215 children uh, from Kamloops Residential School. Um, the press release refers to confirming uh, and not discovering these remains because the fact uh, that the remains were there was not news to the First Nation. Um, there are many mass graves at many the sites of many residential schools um, across the country. Um, uh, so if you believe people when they tell you stories, then you already know that this is so. Um, there are... Um, uh, 28 mass graves um, spoken of across Canada, including on McGill University property. McGill is my own university. Um, McGill has not uh, uh, dedicated the resources to um, validating uh, those stories as far as I'm aware. Um, there are more mass graves in British Columbia than anywhere else. Um, and uh, uh, Canada had a longstanding um, uh, commission called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was dedicated to uh, uh, well, what it says in the name, un uncovering this, the, the stories of mistreatment and um, and finding some um, some peace between uh, the Canadian First Nations and uh, and the rest of the country. Um, a quote from their very long uh, report. 
uh, said throughout the history of Canada's residential school system, there was no effort to record across the entire system the number of students who died while attending the schools each year. Um, this is only coming out now because the federal government has uh, invested money in, um, has given the resources that are required to, uh, to do the sorts of, you know, respectful um, uh, detective work um, that is acceptable to the First Nations um, and that costs money. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommended that uh, this, that money be allocated for this and that didn't happen for a decade. Um, so this is pretty personal for me. Um, uh, I learned today that uh, on the beach where I grew up, I could literally look across at the site of one of these residential schools um, where there are two mass graves. Uh, I think it's pretty crazy that that isn't, that I wasn't taught about that as a child. I don't like having to talk about it. I don't like having to think about it, but I'm also in a university that claims to be trying to deal with issues of indigenous underrepresentation in um, higher education. And I don't think that we can even think honestly about why that is, um, why there is, why there are problems of underrepresentation without recognizing that um, we created them. And we created a situation where it's immensely hard for um, a whole part of our population to have equal access to educational opportunity when what they were you know, what we called education for them consisted of um, ab abuse and suppression and, and in some cases murder. Um, this is not historical, it's historical and it's also continuing the violence against um, indigenous uh, people um, across the coast, particularly women and girls, but not only. Um, and, uh, um, I'm feeling really seriously affected uh, by it at the moment, as you can tell. So I needed to talk to you about it. And um, if my lecture was a little shaky today, um, I apologize. Um, I'll put these slides on my website. And um, these are a few specific locations that um, if you're moved to, um, to donate to anything, um, I think they're all good places where um, organizations doing good work that could that could use your support. Um, I didn't cover everything on my slides, but there are a lot of links to further information which um, which you can uh, look at if you uh, care to learn more. Uh, so I'm just going to um, turn my video off for uh, 60 seconds and um, you can use that as a moment of silence. I need to go and wash my face and then I'll continue with my math.
Okay, so um, uh, I know it's a little hard to go for, from that to um, random graphs, but uh, I'll, that's what we're going to try to do. Um, so uh, I guess I'll try to um, take it easy and just remind you where we were at yesterday. We were sort of halfway through uh, a section that I originally planned as a single lecture and realized it had to be a bit longer to do things carefully. Um, so, uh, so we were talking about uh, random graphs. Um, with fixed surplus. Um, so we defined this class GNS, which was uh, so connected graphs D uh, with vertex set um, N and surplus. Let me just write S of G for the surplus equal to S. And we're trying to understand a uniform sample from GNS for N large. Okay, so we built up by going from, uh, from G to the core of G and then from there to the kernel K of G. And we had this, um, so, and then we had a um, uh, sort of developed two um, uh, combinatorial facts about um, how many ways there are to go back. Um, so going this way, the core and the kernel of a graph are uniquely determined by the graph. And the question was how many cores correspond to a given kernel and how many graphs correspond to a given core. So um, the bulk of the work that we'd done was to prove this proposition, which said that, um, so for a given kernel K with um, vertex set, the first K integers and M edges, um, then as L tends to infinity, the number of uh, cores with vertex set um, L and kernel equal to K is one plus little o one L minus K factorial uh, L to the M minus one over M minus one factorial times a combinatorial factor sigma K. And this just had a factor of a half in it for each loop of the graph of the kernel and a factor of one over um, at j factorial for each uh, multi-edge of multiplicity j. Okay, so, um, so uh, today we will um, prove an asymptotic formula. We'll use this to prove an asymptotic formula for the size of DNS. Um, for S fixed and large, um, we'll uh, and we'll work out this typical structure um, of um, of a uniform sample. Or aspects of the of that typical structure, and in particular, um, see that there's a line breaking construction. of this graph in the large n limit. Okay. Um, any questions? Uh, any questions about the where we're headed? Um, thanks for all the um, chat about the previous topic uh, in the chat. Um, but any questions about the math before I launch in a bit more? Um, okay, so um, I'll keep an eye on the chat and if someone has something. Uh, okay, so uh, so I'd like to first um, use 
Oops. So here we have a proposition which tells us um, how many cores correspond to a given kernel. And now if I pick a random core that with a given surplus, the kernel isn't deterministic. The kernel itself is random. And this proposition will allow us to um, understand the product distribution of that core. So that's one more step we need in order to, to find our asymptotic kernel energy. Um, so let me state, um, state another proposition. Uh, which uh, which accomplishes that. So um, so if I if I fix the surplus, remember I said that the surplus one case um, sort of basically um, all the formulas, all the combinatorial formula end up being the same, but uh, it's just a little bit of a nuisance that the kernel doesn't have any vertices, so I'm just ignoring it. Um, so I'm going to look at surplus at least two and let CL be a uniformly random core. Um, with vertex set L and surplus S. Okay, and, um, and I want to write, uh, so I'm going to define uh, KL to be the kernel of CL, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a minus here. And what this means is that, uh, so relabel the vertices by one up to however many vertices there are. In order. Okay, so this just this is just so that I can talk. What I'm expecting is that the kernel will have some bounded, well, I know the kernel will have a bounded number of vertices. And I just I don't when L gets large, I don't want those labels to go off to infinity. I want to keep them bounded. So I'm just going to collapse them down to um to uh, a bounded set right so if the if the kernel was um was this graph with labels you know for 18 2 and 20 then the so if this is k then k minus would be um just have labels uh one two three and four okay so that's how um, that's um, that's what I mean by um, by uh, k minus, um, and then uh, so we have the proposition um, states two facts. One is that the probability that k l is three regular, so all vertices have degree three, tends to one, as l tends to infinity, and then the second part is that. Um, uh, so for any three regular kernel K that has the correct surplus, so a surplus S, and that's been reduced in this way, so uh, with K equals K minus, uh, then the probability that, that we observe the kernel K, so, so, so that KL is equal to K uh, is just um, proportional to sigma of K to our symmetry, this factor, which had half to the number of loops and then one over J factorial for each, each J multi H. Okay. Um, so that's, um, uh, uh, that's the first thing I'd like to prove. So this, this, um, the sort of Key fact we already saw in the in the formula up here that um, the symmetry factor sigma of k uh, shows up in in this in this count so um, it should certainly show up in the resulting probabilities and then the sort of key fact is that in this combinatorial term you see um, the number of the number of cores so the the number of edges of the kernel plays in heavily to the count here right when when kernels with more edges um, uh, are a lot more common um, than kernels with fewer edges. So um, that's, uh, that's the reason uh, why somehow a typical, um, for, for a typical core, the kernel will have as many edges as possible subject to the constraints on the surplus and that, um, that um, forces the underlying uh, graphs to typically be three regular. Okay, so let's um, just uh, go through that in a bit more detail. So um, 
this does the statement make sense? So we're saying a typical a typical large random core with a fixed surplus will have a three regular kernel, and the probability of a given kernel is just given by its uh, is proportional to its symmetry factor sigma k. Okay, so so to prove this, um, let's let's just note um, that this um, let's think about how many edges a, a a kernel with a given surplus has as a function of its degrees. So if we take a three regular kernel. K with surplus S, um, then it has, um, so it has, um, we know that the number of uh, edges is V minus one plus S. Okay, but on the other hand, uh, if it's three regular, then um, Right, then when we sum up, when we sum up all the, for any graph, right, the handshaking lemma tells us the sum of the degrees is twice the number of edges. Um, and in this case, the sum of the degrees is just three times the number of vertices. So that says that the number of edges is three times the number of vertices over two. Okay, and so that tells us that um, the number of vertices is just uh, twice S minus one. And then the number of edges is S more. Um, uh, so this should be uh, 3S minus 2. OK. Um, uh, 3S minus 3, I suppose, right? Vertices minus 1 uh, plus, um, plus S. Yes, 3S minus 3. OK. Um, so this is, so if we pick a three regular kernel, then this is um, the um, this is our this is the m that we're going to get in um, in our previous formula up here, right? So it's this uh, uh, is the number is that number of edges three s minus three. But um, for any so O T O H that's on the other hand, you know, um, uh, for any non three regular kernel. With surplus s, um, so let me say any non-three regular kernel K with surplus s will have um, the number of edges less than three s minus three, right? Um, again, if you like, uh, just using uh, the handshaking lemma, or or another way to to sort of think of this is if a vertex, if a kernel has a vertex of degree. Uh, bigger than three. So, for example, if a if a kernel has a vertex of degree four, you could sort of uncontract this to make uh, uh, in, into two vertices each of degree three, say, right? So, just by taking this vertex and splitting it in two, we'd get a. Uh, what have we done? So we've added one vertex and one edge. We've um, and it, so we haven't changed the surplus, and now we've created a kernel that has an additional edge. Right. So more generally, if you have a kernel with vertices of degree greater than three, you could sort of sequentially split the vertices of degree greater than three into little trees of vertices of degree three um, and increase the number of edges while doing so. OK, so, um, so that shows that any any um, kernel which um, which is not three regular will have strictly fewer edges than any three regular kernel of that surplus. OK, and so that um, that implies that um, if we count um, all the cores uh, with uh, a given number of vertices and uh, surplus, then um, uh, you know we can split that up according to uh, the um, the number of vertices of the kernel. So again, we're just looking at, uh, at cores here. So with vertex at L and surplus S, and now um, with uh, let's say the um, number of vertices of the kernel is um, is K. Okay, and uh, and our formula for the um, for the number of uh, the number of uh, cores with a with a given uh, kernel, then tells us that that's 
so the sum from one up to two s minus two, uh, L choose K to choose the vertices of the kernel. Um, and then uh, we can sum over kernels K now assuming that the vertex set is just the first K integers. with surplus S. Um, and then uh, what was the formula from the preceding proposition? Sigma of K uh, and then L minus K factorial uh, L to the K plus S minus two. Uh, over K plus S minus two factorial, okay. Um, this is just, this is our, um, our M minus one sitting here. Okay. Um, and now, uh, so the point is that um, in this, um, in this formula, um, uh, so the term uh, K is 2S minus two. Um, right as L, um, uh, let me say as uh, as L tends to infinity. Right as L gets as L gets large, um, uh, uh, the um, oh, the the term the term k is two s minus two um, uh, swamps all the other terms here. So this is um, so this is uh, just one plus little o one, um, and then we we said. So when k is two s minus two, that means the kernel must be three regular, okay? Because that's um, that's basically uh, the uh, the um, well, that's what we saw at the start of the proof. So this is um, so this is now equivalent restricting to uh, k equals two s minus two is equivalent to restricting to uh, three regular kernels. Uh, I think you should remove the equals after one plus the low one. Thank you, thank you. Yes, um, that's the same as restricting to three regular kernels. Um, uh, so with vertex set two s minus two, um, and then we have uh, sigma k um, our symmetry factor, and then uh, l factorial l to the three s minus four uh, over two s minus two factorial three s minus four factorial. Okay, so I've just combined. I, I've I've taken I've taken my L choose K and my L minus K factorial here. That gives me a, um, a, a L factorial over K factorial, right? And here K is two S minus two. Um, so the, um, the this becomes the three S minus four, and this is this. Okay, um, so that's just um, that's that's just the same as saying. Um, one plus the low of one, whoops, I seem to have a habit of writing equals after one plus the low of one today for some reason, um, times the number of cores uh, with vertex set. And, um, and surplus S with the regular core. Uh, Okay, so that's that's really the first thing we wanted to prove, right? We said if we look at all the cores with vertex set L and surplus S, that's asymptotically equivalent to looking at um, cores with surplus S with three regular kernel. Okay, and so, um, uh, um, well, what was the first statement? Um, so if we sample uniformly, um, right? This first statement was that if we pick uh, a random core with this. Uh, vertex set and surplus S, then the probability we see a three regular kernel is one, um, but that probability is just the ratio of this, the size of this set to the size of this set. So that tends to one. And so that says that the probability that KL is three regular tends to one. Why do the term, someone asks, uh, why do the terms K equals two S minus two dominate asymptotically? I'm a little confused. Um, 
okay, um, maybe I can say another word about that. Um, so um, let's, maybe I should have uh, uh, combined um, so we have this, I'm just, I'm going to combine this expression and this expression, okay? So we have L choose K, L minus K factorial, L to the K plus S minus two over K plus S minus two factorial, okay? Um, so these two terms together give me a, um, L factorial over K factorial um, and, uh, then I have that times L to the K plus S minus two over K plus S minus two factorial. Okay. So, you know, K, so K takes some range of values. It's S is bounded. So this or fixed. So this is some bounded range of values for K. So the denominator here, uh, you know, will get, will be smaller or bigger over this range of K, but it's, but it's, it's, it's bounded from above by a constant, you know, what you get if you put in the largest value of K. Whereas, um, in, in the numerator, um, as L tends to infinity, you see here, this term, um, this term really depends massively on K. The larger, the larger you have, it's always a polynomial and the coefficient of the polynomial is bigger when K is bigger. So, so asymptotically the largest term, uh, the largest value of K is gonna make, is, gonna, is going to give the largest growth rate of all of these bounded number of terms. Okay, I hope that that um, clarifies. Um, Right, um, so that was the, the first claim. Um, and then the second, for the second claim, um, well, it's, uh, right. The first just said that we were gonna get a three regular kernel and we worked that out by computing the ratios of the number of three regular kernels to all the kernels for, uh, over this class. Um, and then you can work out um, why B is true for in exactly the same way. You just say, okay, well, let's work out the ratio of the number of, of, of cores with a specific kernel K versus um, all the, um, say, three regular kernels now um, over this class. Um, so, for, so I'll just do that quickly. Um, so, uh, so for, for B, uh, you know, fix a three regular kernel uh, K with vertex set two S minus two um, and surplus S, right? So then if we look at the number of um, cores with, um, with vertex set L and with, um, with kernel, so I, I, I can say with surplus S, um, I don't really need to, but, and then with reduced kernel equal to K, then, um, then that's just, uh, uh, you know, up to lower order terms, there's choosing the vertices of the of the kernel, um, and then there's uh, the factor from the previous proposition. So we get um, um, uh, L minus 2S minus 2 factorial, that's our L minus K factorial, L to the 3S minus 4 uh, over 2S minus 2 factorial, 3S minus 4 factorial. And then, so again, combining these these terms together, that's uh, one plus little o one, um, and then we get um, L factorial L to the three s minus four over uh, the same denominator as before, two s minus two factorial, three s minus four factorial. Um, and so then again, you just take ratios to prove the the to to see that the the proportion of cores with a specific kernel is just oh I missed a sigma k on the on the right so is it's just proportional to sigma k right it's um I mean all the in 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 this expression and in in this expression uh you you just end up with one plus the of one times the ratio of sigma k over the sum of that sigma k over all the kernels so taking ratios proves B. <clears throat> um, there's a comment in the chat I don't quite understand, uh, but it might be me being slow. 
Uh, uh, but okay, um, I think that I think that that's that proof is fine. Um, so um, so let's note. Let, let me just um, note the formula a formula that came out of the proof. Um, so. Uh, This is a formula for the number of um, cores with a given vertex set and surplus. Uh, so that's um, this uh, L factorial L to the 3s minus 4 uh, over 2s minus 2 factorial 3s minus 4 factorial. I'm going to use that uh, next and then the sum over sum of sigma k over uh, k three regular um, kernel with uh, vertex set 2s minus 2. OK, um, <clears throat> so now I'd like to uh, move on to the um, the first main goal. So what were my, my the goals I mentioned? Um, uh, so the asymptotic formula for for GNS, um, and that will sort of quite straightforwardly give us access to the typical structure and the line breaking construction um, by the same sorts of techniques we use for trees. So, um, so the um, here's here's the theorem. I, I think I'm not sure. Um, I didn't do my historical research. Um, I know this is certainly like Bender and Canfield did a lot of work on the sorts of enumerative formula I'm about to present, and this one might be due to them, but in the case of bounded surplus, it might predate them as well. Um, so, um, so I'd like to, I'd like to, I need just to make my formula simpler. I'm going to give myself another kind of name for a symmetry factor thing. So, uh, this is kappa of s, and it's collecting all of the sort of things that stay. Um, that only depend on S in the, this formula up here. Okay, um, so it's uh, it's that times this. And uh, uh, and I'll do that for S at least two, and then cap of S is one for S equals one. Just because the formula I'm about to state actually is also true for, um, uh, I, 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 never mind. I said I was going to stick to um, s at least two. So let me just do do that. Okay. Then, um, so for any s at least two, um, the number of graphs with vertex set n and surplus s is asymptotic to um, kappa s uh, times n to the n minus 2 plus 3s2. Um, then times the integral of x to the 3s minus 3 e to the minus x squared on 2 ds. OK, so that's, that's the first part of the theorem. And the second part of the theorem uh, says that um, if we take a uniform sample from GNS, then the size of its core, the number of vertices of its core, uh, has order n to the half and converges in distribution to uh, a gamma, well, again, the square root of a gamma uh, random variable. Okay, so this is um, this guy here has density uh, x to the three s minus three e to the minus x squared on two. Well, let me just say density proportional to that. Uh, um, uh, Non-negative. Uh, 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 on the non-negative half line. Yeah. 
and that integral should be dx. Thanks. Okay. Um, so before um, before proving this, I'd like to just um, mention uh, uh, a sort of intuitive way of, of guessing at some of the aspects of the scaling in the theorem. Okay, uh, that came out of a um, uh, conversation with Yinon Spinka after, um, or I was reminded of this by a conversation after last class, and I thought it was worth um, worth sharing with you. Okay, so um, note that here, if if s is zero, okay, then um, um, well, pretending the integral, I don't know exactly what the integral is doing, but let's pretend the integral is a con some constant depending on s, okay, another constant depending on s, s is zero, this term goes away. This is saying that the number of graphs with n vertices and surplus zero is like n to the n minus two. Well, that's just Cayley's formula, okay, so that checks out. And we also saw that for those graphs, for random trees, the typical distances were of order n to the half, right, if you, if that's the, the global structure, if you take random samples, the points you see are at order into the half distance. Okay, so let's now think about building a, I'm going to go back to the global structure, um, and this in particular, this picture of the continuum random tree. Let's think about um, increasing the surplus of this graph by just sort of adding some edges. Okay, so if I want a graph of surplus two, one thing I could do is pick two random vertices and just wire them together. Okay, and I could do that again, pick a couple of random vertices, wire them together. So add an edge connecting them. Okay, so um, what do I expect? Well, a pair of random vertices will have, well, first of all, the number of ways to, um, so the number of ways to pick, um, say S pairs of um, vertices will look like N to the two S. Right, because there's well, that's literally what it is. Um, there's n vertices. If I don't care about, you know, ignoring the possibility of choosing the same vertex twice, um, that's um, that's how many options I have. Okay, and now when I wire those vertices together, the paths, but the original paths between them in the tree, we know typically had um, had length of order n to the half. Okay, and we're, and so we're going to get a collection of sort of cycles of length of order n to the half. So that is kind of in agreement with the idea that the total number of vertices of the core should be of order n to the half. Okay, um, so that's a first observation. Um, and now on the other hand, you can ask, um, you know, did we really, um, does, this, does this idea of um, taking a, a tree and adding together k, um, adding s random wirings of pairs of vertices, does that give us a reasonable guess for the for the count of GNS, should it be like, uh, you know, n to the n minus two times n to the two s maybe? Okay, well, the thing is that when I add one of these, um, when I add one of these edges, you know, if, if, you, if you only see the graph after I add the edge, then it could have been any of the edges on this cycle that I added. Um, and any of those could be broken to recover a tree. Okay, so that means that for each of the edges I add, typically there are about n to the half possibilities of what it was. When you only look at the picture you get after the edges added. Okay, so that means for each of these ad added edges, there's a symmetry factor of, or a, a sort of, um, yeah, uh, I guess a um, indistinguishability factor corresponding to figuring out which edge was added of n to the minus a half. Okay, so and if so, if we add s edges, that gives us a, a factor n to the minus s over two. Okay, and so that um, suggests a scaling of n to the n minus two uh, plus three s over two, and that is indeed what appears in the in the theorem. Okay, so that's that's a sort of back of the envelope way to guess at how big this set should be once you know a bit about the typical structure of a random tree, and it and it ends up lining up with the truth. Okay, um, so maybe that's a good point. Uh, to um, uh, to pause for a minute and, and take questions before I go into the future of this.
I see one question in the chat. So, so is the model uh, contiguous to taking a random tree and wiring S pairs of vertices? Um, yeah, yeah, um, but it gets more and more singular as S gets bigger. Um, and uh, there was another question. What about the integral factor in this formula? I'm not sure that I completely got your intuition. Um, uh, yeah, so I didn't really, my, the, intu the intuition was really just for the order of magnitude. It doesn't, it's not a fine enough intuition to get at the integral factor. It's just for the, the order of, and not even the, sorry, I don't even mean the order of magnitude. I just mean the order of the exponents. It, it sort of gave us a guess that this end of the half scaling for typical distances might still be correct. And that this might be the, um, the correct power of N um, to show up. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, so let's, um, let's continue. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, um, so establishing this, this asymptotic and this information about typical distances uh, in the core or typical sizes in the core, the typical size of the core, which relates to typical distances in the core, sorry. Um, So, um, so let's 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 start just by writing down uh, the size of GNS as a sum over graphs with um, surplus S in a given core. Um, right. So that's uncontroversial. I'm just splitting up this set according to the size of the core. Um, and now uh, we already saw a formula for um, uh, uh, for how many ways, how many reconstructions of a given graph there are from it from the core. Once the vertices of the core are fixed, that so 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 this is fixing the number of vertices of the core, and then the number of reconstructions was l times n to the n minus l minus one, and that um, and and then we rather than looking at arbitrary. Uh, uh, graphs with a given core, we can just look at arbitrary cores with a given surplus. Okay. Um, so that's, um, that's exact. And now, now we use our asymptotic from the, um, from the previous calculation to say that that's, um, uh, asymptotic to um, summing over uh, L at least one. Um, so N choose L, L N to the N minus L minus one. And then we had, um, I've, I gave myself this notation kappa for all of the combinatorial terms that showed up in this formula, right? So kappa encapsulates all of this. And so now I just have, um, kappa of s times, whoops, l factorial uh, l to the 3s minus 4. Okay, um, and let me just rearrange that a tiny bit, write that as 1 plus little o1 uh, kappa s, and then times the sum l at least 1 of, um, I think I'll take this n choose l and l factorial to, and write that as um, n following factorial l. Um, so that then I have um, just n following factorial l, n to the n minus l minus one. Uh, and then I got an extra um, power of l. So l to the three s minus three. Okay, so this is, this is a very nice formula um, because um, it also allows us, well, I want to remember in this formula that this is really, um, so the, the like the l term here, uh, uh, so for a given, if I, rather than summing over L, I fix L. Um, 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 then I'm not counting all the graphs, I'm only counting the graphs. Um, uh, 
Uh, so, um, I'm counting these guys. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's, um, that's important because now I want to say what are the, do I want to figure out what are the dominant contributions to this sum and any, con any, you know, for any range of L where I can show that there's the, the contribution is asymptotically unimportant, I can say, oh, well then that's an unlikely thing to have happen uh, in this, in this set, or that doesn't contribute much to the size of the set. Okay. So I, I'm going to split a, I, I'm going to use a few bounds now. Um, so, uh, um, the first one is, uh, is simple. So, um, so this, this, uh, um, oh, I forgot to, so let me, um, let's say that this, this thing is, um, uh, let, let's state some bounds on this part here. So this is, so I, this is always at most n to the n minus one times L to the three S minus three just by bounding all of the terms in this following factorial by, uh, by N. Okay. Um, that's a, that's an upper bound that always holds. And now when L is not too large, I can use my approximation for the following factorial that we've used before. Um, so we can uh, say that this is, um, so N to the N minus one, L to the three S minus three times the product of one minus I over N from zero to L minus one. Um, uh, so when, when L doesn't get too big, that's um, uh, N to the N minus one, L to the three S minus three uh, times E to the minus L squared over two N. Um, one plus little O one. And we saw before that that's valid for uh, as long as L is low of the two thirds. Okay. And, um, and finally, um, for any, uh, so another upper bound, um, for any uh, L we have, um, then this same expression now, using that one minus X is at most E to the minus X, uh, we can say that this is at most, uh, L to the three S minus three, and then E to the minus L, L minus one over two. Okay, so this is just using that um, one minus I over N is at most E to the minus I over N, and then summing, um, you know, interpreting the product as a E to the minus a sum. Okay, um, so what I want to do now with these bounds is to show that in this sum, only the terms where uh, L is of order N to the half uh, uh, contribute. Okay, so the goal is uh, uh, show that L is theta n to the half terms dominate the sum. Um, uh, right, so um, so let's first look at the, the terms when L is small compared to n to the half. Okay, so uh, uh, let's fix a function omega of n, which tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. Okay, then um, if we look at uh, the number of graphs in GNS where the core has at most n to the half over omega n vertices, then, uh, then we get that this is at most um, the sum from one to n to the half over omega n. And now we can just use the bound, um, our first bound here, n to the n minus one, l to the three s minus three. Um, uh, uh, to get um, that that's at most, uh, so one plus little o one. Um, now we have n to the half over omega n sum ends. Um, and then an upper bound on all of them is n to the n minus one, uh, n to the half over omega n to the three s minus three. Um, okay, so, uh, 
so now if we just collect all of the, we can collect all of the terms involving n on top. We have an n minus one uh, plus a half and then plus three s minus three. And then we have something tending to infinity on the bottom. Okay, so that gives us little o of n to the uh, n minus a half plus uh, 3s minus 3 over 2. Okay. Um, and, uh, and that's going to be small compared with the total count. Okay, so that's, that says, that's going to tell us that the terms when L is small compared to n to the half are unimportant. Okay, so that's, um, uh, this will deal with the terms with L is little o into the half. Okay, now let's um, try to deal with terms with uh, uh, um, L much bigger than into the half. So um, if we look at graphs with vertex set uh, at least n to the half times omega n, then, uh, uh, then we get. So I'll use the I'll use this um, this upper bound here. Okay. So again, this this holds for any um, uh, for any value of uh, of l. Um, so we can let me just uh, pull this down. So this is at most uh, so one plus little o one. Uh, kappa s n to the n minus one, and then some l at least n to the half times omega n. Uh, let's see, I already took out the n to the n minus one, so we have uh, l to the three s minus three e to the minus l l minus one over two n. Okay, and that's um, asymptotic to uh, so kappa s um, n to the n minus one plus three uh, s over two. I'll just multiply and divide uh, by n to the three s over two, um, uh, and then we have uh, some l at least uh, n to the half omega n l over uh, n to the half three uh, s. Uh, minus three e to the minus l l minus one over two n. I'm a little bit confused about my power of n here. Um, I should have a three s minus three over two. Yeah, because I've just um, I have an n to the three s minus three over two here, so I'd better put one out front. Okay, um, so um, you know, up th so th this looks like this looks like the tail of a of an integral, right? Of the form x to the three s minus three to the minus x squared over two um, on 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 a mesh size of n to the minus a half. Okay, so this whole this this whole term here um, will contribute a little o n to the half, and so. Uh, the whole expression is then uh, little o of kappa s times uh, n to the n minus one plus three s minus three over two uh, times n to the half. Okay, so that that deals with the um, uh, with terms where l is much larger than n to the half. Okay, um, so all of that is just um, to essentially um, knock off the parts of this sum which are asymptotically going to be unimportant. And now for the range L is of order n to the half, we, we don't use bounds, we use this asymptotic here uh, to, uh, to approximate the sum by, uh, by the integral that we claimed in the, um, in the statement of the theorem, okay, by, uh, by this integral here. Okay, so that's the last step. Um, so, uh, 
So if we we're going to sum over um, terms where L is between uh, n to the half of omega n and omega n n to the half. Um, and uh, we get, um, so, so the number of graphs in GNS whose core size is in this range is uh, so one plus little o one sum over this range. I won't write the range. Um, so kappa s uh, n to the n minus one l to the three s minus three e to the minus l squared over two n. Um, so here, I guess I should assume um, W and omega n tends to infinity slowly enough that n to the half omega n is little o n to the two thirds. Okay, because that's uh, my middle asymptotic. Let me just scroll back up. Um, this this asymptotic here was valid provided um, l was little o n to the two thirds. Okay, and that's what I've used. Um, okay, um, but this is, um, uh, this is just, uh, one plus little o one kappa s, uh, and now n to the, um, if I do the same thing as before, multiply and divide by, um, n to the, um, n to the three s minus three over two to, to see this sum as an integral, um, so now maybe if I want to do that, I really should write the, the bounds of the integral, right? So um, I'm asking here for, I'm asking right here, for, I think the, the nice way to write it to see this is I'm asking for L over N to the half uh, to, to go from, um, uh, to lie in the range um, one over omega N, uh, omega N. Okay, so that's the um, uh, that that's what I'm summing over here. Uh, and so, you know, in in the in the limit in n, that's um, that's this integrand ranging from zero to infinity. Um, and so here I get um, n to the n minus uh, a half plus three uh, s minus three over two times the integral from zero to infinity of x to the three s minus three e to the minus s squared on two dx. <clears throat> okay, so that's the, this is what I wanted. This is, this, I've, um, I've found, well, this, this gives me a lower bound on the size of the set I wanted to count. And the lower bound is actually what I'm claiming is the correct asymptotic, but the, but the remainder terms that I already derived are both of smaller order. And so in fact, then the whole set must have that size. Okay, so that's, um, uh, th that tells me uh, how many graphs there are um, in the set GNS up to uh, lower order correction. Um, and then if I want to go from there to uh, working out the, um, the typical size of the core, well, we know what to do. We just say the probability of the core has a given size. Um, uh, L is just a ratio and it's a ratio of two two um, combinatorial quantities that we now understand well, right? So, um, so, this, uh, so this proves A and then for B, um, you know, um, if we take a uniformly random uh, graph in GNS and for any positive X um, and any function L, which is one plus little o one x n to the half, we'll get uh, that the probability, so the core of G has size L, that's the ratio of, um, so the number of graphs 
let me try to make my um, random graph look a bit different from the um, deterministic graph. So it's bolder. Um, the number of graphs uh, such that the core has L vertices over the total size of GNS. Um, and so that's, um, that's just, uh, so our, our asymptotic for the numerator is um, n to the uh, n minus one L to the three S minus three uh, e to the minus L squared on two N. Uh, and then our formula for the denominator is, uh, is I don't need to copy the asymptotic because I already have an asymptotic. Uh, so this guy here. Okay, and that's um, uh, just canceling out the factors of n um, and using that l is asymptotically xn to the half. That's um, so x to the 3s minus 3 e to the minus x squared on 2 divided by the integral. Um, you know, meh. I'm sorry that the, my variable of integration is the same as my constant, but I think you, uh, you can deal with that. Okay, and that's, um, I mean, the key point is just that the, that the expression I get is proportional to this uh, constant here, x to three s minus three, the mass x squared on two, because that's, um, that's all I was claiming, right? Was that um, the, the size of the core divided by n to the half converged to a random variable whose density was proportional to this expression. Okay. All right, so, uh, so that's um, uh, sort of the, the heart of the lecture. Now in the last, uh, say, 15 minutes or so, I want to um, talk a bit about how to um, how the line breaking construction of a, of, uh, of a random graph in GNS looks like. Um, the sort of, um, I think it's worth speaking a little bit philosophically about it before I go into the details, but before I even get to that, um, so that proof, I mean, I don't know, these sorts of combinatorial proofs where you have to keep track of your estimates and things can be, can be a, little, a little bit, um, I don't know, um, hard to stay focused during, I'm wondering if everyone feels like they got the, um, uh, the, the main message of, of this proof um, uh, or if there are any um, questions or things I can clear up before I go on to talk about the line breaking construction. Okay, feel free if you think of th something, but I haven't given you enough time to type. Just cut in, and I'll try to try to fill in. Um, okay, so uh, so there's there's this sort of fascinating. Um, so Well, that's what the rest of the lecture is about. The, here's the philosophy. So there's this sort of fascinating thing that happens where, you know, um, we said that when we're doing a, the line breaking construction of, the, of, of, uh, of a random, of a large random tree, somehow, you know, even though all of these lengths are not um, equal, and when you attach the next line to the line breaking construction, you're more likely to fall in a, you know, more likely to attach to a longer edge than a shorter one, obviously. Distributionally, the property somehow maintains this magical symmetry that the lengths of these edges are exchangeable. And so if I sort of pretend I can't see the lengths and ask which edge I'm likely to attach to next, it's equally likely to be any edge of the tree. Okay. And that's, for that, that property really depends crucially on the precise nature of the of the randomness, you know, that, and it's, it's, it's quite remarkable that it maintains itself as the process goes along. After k steps, 
this joint distribution is just right to give you both an exchangeable set of edge lengths and a set of edge lengths that after another step again gives you an um, uh, gives you an exchangeable set of edge lengths. So you need to know that you're attaching to a uniform place. And then the way that that attachment splits up the mass needs to give you back some exchangeability. Okay. And so um, now if you think about, um, imagine taking, um, imagine taking the kernel of some random graph with a fixed surplus. Maybe you get a picture that looks like, I don't know, this. Okay, now um, it may be the case that sort of typically when you get a, when you get a kernel like this, typically there's one very long path and then a bunch of short paths, for example. Okay, and then what would happen if you sort of start to ask about where the where the where random leaves, for example, attach to this picture? They would all typically tend to attach to to the one very long edge. Okay. Um, but that's not, um, that's not in fact what happens. What happens is that in a uh, random graph with a fixed surplus, there's again enough exchangeability, enough symmetry present in the picture that all of these edge lengths distributionally are equivalent. And moreover, their total length, you saw this gamma random variable showing up again, the square root of a gamma, like what occurred for trees, is just the right distribution to maintain this symmetry as you start to ask about um, where things attach to the kernel. So where the vertices uh, attach to the core, where the things that got peeled off to build, to, to reduce the graph to its core, where they actually attached, um, you, um, you again see, um, see a, an exchangeability being maintained. Um, so, that's, um, so that's quite a beautiful fact that, um, that uh, in fact, there's enough exchangeability and symmetry in these um, in these sorts of uh, sorts of graphs to have a line breaking construction um, it it's somehow a priori doesn't feel obvious to me uh, but but the math works out quite cleanly okay so um, so I'd like to describe without um, maybe let me think how I want to do this um, I think the last two things I'll do Um, uh, uh, right to the lecture. So um, uh, one is describe the um, line breaking construction, and two, and the second is a state. Uh, convergence theorem. For, the, for that line breaking construction. Okay, so um, uh, so so the first part is um, uh, so. Line breaking construction sort of in limit. Okay, so it, it works like this. First you pick a random three regular kernel. Uh, so um, so think of um, so G is a uniformly random graph from GNS with n equal to infinity informally. Okay. Um, so first you pick a random three regular kernel K um, with surplus S um, with the probability distribution we already um, uh, we already saw. So, um, so the probability random K is a given graph. Uh, kernel K is proportional to sigma of K. Okay. Second is uh, we'll let um, so we'll sample a vector of edge lengths for the kernel. Uh, so this is going to be um, distributed as some random variable H times 
a vector y1 up to y 3k minus 2, um, uh, 3k minus 3, 3k minus 3. Um, so we know the total size was asymptotically uh, the square root of a gamma 3s minus 2 over 2 a half. Okay, and then so that's the total length of the of the core, um, and then it just gets split up um, exchangeably among all the edges. So according to a Dirichlet, one one vector. Okay, then um, uh, so um, you know, and assign edge lengths. Uh, xe to the edges of k. Okay, so that's going to give us a picture like um, this one that we used last class. Okay, where you have, so if you ignore the edge lengths, you have a random three, you have some three regular kernel, and then the edges have their various lengths. Okay, now the, the line, for the line breaking part, so we'll let um, pi, i at least one, be a Poisson point process, not on zero infinity, but starting from h, from this total length. So on h infinity, uh, thank you, 3s minus 3. Um, uh, so this is a Poisson point process on h infinity. Uh, uh, um, so with rate um, as before, so the rate is just um, the same as the um, the time, but now we're not starting at zero, okay? And the atoms as before are listed in increasing order. So P1 is less than P2 is, and so on, okay? And now um, we'll, um, so starting from uh, this kernel with edge lengths k, then uh, for i at least one, we construct uh, gi from gi minus one by attaching a new branch. So um, a branch of length. Uh, so pi minus pi minus one to a uniformly sampled point of gi minus one. And here, I guess I'm setting so that I can get started. I'll set p naught uh, to be h. Okay, so, um, uh, and by a, by a, a uniformly sampled point of G I minus one, I mean, this, th these lengths give you a, a total length and you just, you know, take Lebesgue measure on that length normalized to be a probability measure. Um, so, um, uh, and then uh, giving the new leaf the label uh, I. Okay, so um, as a picture of that, you know, if here's, um, you can think of that there, there being this total initial length. I've just imagined I've just lined up all this length along these edges um, at the start, going from zero to H, and then we start to see points. So here's P1, here's P2, here's P3. Okay, and so I take this length and I attach it uniformly along the um, the length measure here, and then put a leaf labeled one at the end. Okay, and then I take this length and attach it uniformly. Maybe it falls over here. I put a leaf labeled two at the end, and so on. So this is how I build my sequence of graphs. Okay, um, the third point, you know, could attach. Um, note that. Um, I say that the branch attaches to a uniformly sampled point of gi minus one. So now the third point could, for example, attach onto this branch that we added in step two. 
Okay, so it's always, you're, you're allowed to attach to things that get added over the course of the process. Okay, is that, is that picture clear? Sort of how the construction works. So for any fixed K, what you end up with is some graph. It has, the kernel is the same as the kernel you started with. And now if you, but now if you ignore the um, edge lengths, then the combinatorial graph sitting there isn't a core anymore. It has some trees hanging off of the core. And at each step, one new, uh, uh, two new vertices and two new edges are added because you subdivide and add a leaf and that splits this edge in two and adds one more edge like that. Okay, so now I'll just finish the class um, by stating the convergence result. Um, so this is without proof. Um, so if we let uh, G be a uniformly random graph, I'll write GN from, uh, from GNS and let L1 up to LK be the um, K smallest labeled leaves. of GN. Okay, now let's let, um, uh, I'll write GNK not um, uh, for the graph that consists of the core of GN uh, together with the paths from L1 up to LK to GN. Okay, so I'm just starting from the core and I, I, I look at these leaves, each of them. Uh, so by leaf, I just mean a vertex of degree one now. I look at the path from the leaf um, into the, um, into the, that should say core, uh, to core GN. Um, and uh, I guess I was calling that CGN. Okay, and now let's um, uh, reduce this um, uh, to um, to something that looks um, a bit more like uh, just a graph without edge lengths. So let's replace um, all uh, maximal. So actually, what I just said is a bit inaccurate. What I mean is, you know, what did we do for trees? We took the k smallest labeled leaves. That gave us some tree. We reduced that tree to a finite combinatorial part, which was the shape. And then we separately recorded the lengths of the edges on the shape. So I'm gonna do the same thing here, but for, um, for the whole graph. So I'm gonna take kind of the shape of this graph we've built. And so what I mean by that is I'll replace all maximal degree two paths um, in this graph G and K naught by edges and label those edges with the lengths of, of the paths that, that, um, that they came from. Form, um, and that's the thing I'll call GNK. Okay, so this is now like a graph shape with edge with edge lengths, okay, um, and then for all um, k at least one, um, the thing I get by rescaling those edge lengths by n to the minus a half. So that that's some finite combinatorial shape with edge lengths that I rescale by n to the minus a half that converges in distribution to G k as n tends to infinity. So um, there are more nice um, sort of combinatorial, combinatorial and distributional identities um, that I could tell you about to do with things like the, um, the total kind of the way that the total mass of the leaves, the, the total number of leaves that attach to a given edge evolves over time and things like that. Um, it's related to um, polya urns um, and part, it's a little bit developed in the exercises. Um, uh, but I think that um, I think that for the most part, I'm going to uh, leave uh, leave off talking about um, random graphs with a fixed surplus um, for the time being, 
and next move on to uh, talking about um, branching processes and then uh, random graphs. Uh, and we'll see when we start to look at the st structure of random graphs that, um, that the work we've done in these first five lectures will, will pay off there as well. Um, great, so thank you all uh, for sticking with me today and uh, uh, I'm happy to answer questions in the chat. Um, I see a couple, thanks. Um, I see a couple, uh, I'll pause on Delphine Amen, uh, GK. So, um, so GK, um, sorry, I called it GI a second ago. It's this, the graph that's built from the core, the graph with edge lengths that's built from the core by adding uh, K, uh, random uh, k leaves in this way uh, using the Poisson process. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Yinon uh, had a, yeah, made my statement here slightly more precise. So if you want, um, I mean, the, uh, I, I should have been um, perhaps, um, uh, yeah, so I, I sort of glossed over a little bit the issue of labeling of the vertices here. Um, this this kernel should really have um, vertices labeled one up to two k minus two k minus two, and then the labels in um, th this this kernel here, um, this core here, the the kernel vertices within the core should be also be relabeled by one up to however many vertices there are, which typically will be two k minus two. So thanks for thanks for that. Um, I'll I'll check if I'm careful enough in my typed notes, and if I'm not, then I'll add a I'll, I'll fix that. And I think I am. Um, uh, and Delphine says, I guess the exchangeability of the edge lengths at any fixed step of the construction can be seen directly from doing the same combinatorics, replacing the core with the subgraph spanned by the core plus k leaves of the smallest label. Uh, yeah, you can do things that way um, if you like. That's true. Um, 